So today I'm just going to talk about observations and vineyards that I've seen as I've, I've gone around the country uh, or, or around the world and we'll see some videos from some um, different people as well. I just want to back up that I am I am a little bit qualified to talk about vines. I don't normally talk about my history and viticulture, but really I only became a winemaker because I, I didn't really want the winemaker coming into the vineyard and, and uh, telling me what to do. So before I was an enologist, I, I did horticulture at Lincoln University in New Zealand. This is Today, Lincoln has a wine program, but there was no wine program back then. And we were doing uh, horticulture, which was, and, and it wasn't called organics or biodynamics back then. It was called companion planting and double digging, which was the way we used to do it. And then I went on to Australia and did a, and I did a uh, diploma in viticulture, uh, bef again, before I went on and did a postgrad in enology. So last, uh, a couple of Zooms ago, number three, we talked about establishing a vineyard. So I'm just going to lead on from there. We talked mainly about planting and how we go about doing that. So the couple of things that were really important during that talk was the east facing aspect, which I consider to be totally important. The spacing, and of course that's determined by the slope and other mechanical implements and tractors, et cetera, which we'll talk a bit about today. And then the VSP, which I can't uh, say enough about. So today we'll miss out on a lot of the other things that we talked about last time. Again, the aspect is really important. This is one of the, the this is probably my favorite shot of a vineyard. It, it's a four o'clock in the afternoon on, on uh, August 15 on a hillside. And you can see that the shadow is directly uh, over the vine. But if you go a lot further north, like where we are in Naramata, so this is in the Northern Okanagan. So Okanagan, for those that don't know in Canada, British Columbia, there's four lakes. This is the northernmost lake of the four is Okanagan. And if you're that far north, you really have to be facing west to get any form of heat. So this is looking west and this is a Pinot Noir vineyard in front of us. And that's really the only way you can get a uh, warm enough is by actually facing west. So there is some exceptions if you're talking about more extremes in latitude. This is a really interesting shot from a uh, vineyard uh, to the south. This is, this is a, the bottom left photo I'm talking about. This is in the Lake Osoyas. Osoyas is the lake that crosses both uh, Canada and the US. But you can see in this photo, this was taken at 4 p.m. in the afternoon as well. This is a Cabernet, uh, sorry, this is a Merlot vineyard. And you can see, I, I jokingly put here, one side of the vineyard is 1 million percent in the sun. So the sun is on this side of the canopy all day. It actually never gets to this side of the canopy. So yes, they planted on the slope, because they, they felt they had to, but you have a huge problem here because it, it, everything turns to raisins. And you can see here that the leaves are green and, photos, and photosynthetic, but because of the extreme exposure, we still get raisining. And you can see we've already got lignification on the rachis and it's fairly early in the season. As a result, what they do is we'll see a little bit later, they remove the leaves uh, in mid canopy and you can see here on the shadow on the ground that they remove the leaves and what they're trying to do is get some form of sunlight onto this side of the road. As a result we end up picking the two sides of the vineyard separately. Believe it or not we pick, uh, we, we don't need to go into detail, but we actually pick the after, the, the shady side first and then we pick the, the other side later. Completely different wines. Uh, but planting distances are really important and uh, despite everything else, and it's really, really complicated to talk about planting distances. There are just so many things, the aspect, the tractor width, the vigor of the soil and how much water holding capacity we have, what sort of rootstocks you're using and how deep they are. And in-ground pests, obviously we all know about phylloxera, but I'm gonna introduce you to a couple of new pests today. One of them is called Magalaroas, which is having a huge impact these days. And whether or not you plant organically and what sort of pruning that you wanna do. But the end result, still has to be your 15 buds per meter, your 13 leaves per shoot. This is a Nick Goldschmidt drawing, as you can tell. This is a spur prune vineyard, which you uh, have seen me talk about before, but I just want to show how hard it is to get it into this uh, shape because we put the wires across up here. So this is our cane, our old, old cane, and we leave two bud spur, a two bud spur, and a two bud spur. Now the vine naturally wants to grow like this. So, it's, so you'll see time and time again, it's very hard to get spur position vineyards into a vertical shoot position. 
Whereas on a cane prune vineyard, this is last year's wood, we get one bud, one bud, one bud, and those canes go directly up. So it's much easier for us to get us into a VSP position when, we, uh, when we're cane pruning versus when we're spur pruning. Hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. Here's an example of that. This is a cane prune vineyard. It's 50 centimeters long, 10 centimeters in the head, so 60 centimeters from the head to the end of the vine. You can see we've got nice even bud push, five buds, which is pretty, pretty normal for us. And here's an interesting vine where they're running an experiment, which we'll see this year. This is a, a uh, cane prune on this side, and on this side of the vine, they put a spur prune to compare on the same vine. So we'll see what crazy result we get this year. So this is this wood is only two years old, and this cane, this uh, two bud spur, two bud spur. This is this is uh, the, the buds they left out in the, in the winter this year. It is possible to get a spur position vineyard in a vertical position with a lot of work. You can see this is an old cane here again, and we'll have the two bud position in there. This is a cane prune vineyard. You can see how uh, easy it is to get it in the vertical position and consistently good sized canopy all the way through. And of course, the key for me is using these clips and we use about four to five clips per vine. These things today are biodegradable. A lot of them are made out of sugar cane and cardboard is the other alternative. For those that are unclear on the concept of vertical shoot positioning, this is what it is, you use clips. And so this is Mel Bag, and we've been using clips here to get these shoots into straight positions. And you can only do VSP, vertical shoot positioning, by using clips. And by using clips, it means that we can do less management during the season, we can do less leaf removal, and this is an unusual vineyard. This is Petit Vidot, we're only doing one shoot per spur position, as you can see, because we're trying to make very high quality out of this Petit Vidot. Anyway, each shoot has its own clip, and in a, we'll be in a nice vertical position, and we will clip the second wire as we get on in the season. It was pretty funny, I named it by two different varieties, but it was Petit Vidot. <laughs> Uh, but here's a here's a cane a spur prune position vineyard and you can see it's very hard to get these canes in the vertical position and because of that we have to do a lot more leaf removal which means we get more exposure later on in the season when the temperatures get up and and well, we hope that that doesn't happen but we'll get more sunburn and uh, raisining in a situation like this so because we save time during the winter in pruning it does not mean that we save time during the season in terms of makeup and here's a great photo of a spur position vineyard. You can see there's the old cane. And because there's no light exposure going on to make these buds fruitful, where's the crop? And that's another really big impact. If you don't get enough light onto these buds two years ago, which determines, if you've heard me talk about that, determines the fruitfulness, you can see you actually get no fruit. And this vineyard yeah, needs a hell of a lot of suckering just to get light in there. So, you know, what happened in the past? I mean, historically, uh, they had yields and they had good results. And so what, what happened pre-prohibition and, and what was their experience? And, and why don't we plant like that anymore? Well, a lot of it's to do with cost and efficiency because of, in those days, they were smaller plantations. They had a lot of hand labor. They were basically family operations. But today, because of economics of scale, we have uh, a lot of other considerations that uh, we need to consider. And then how are we going to be able, what, what, how are we going to plant in the future is always a question that, uh, that uh, bothers me. And, and uh, I don't know the answer to that. If I knew that, <laughs> I'd be doing it myself. But I think we're going to have to continue to, for, for high quality vineyards, hand labor is still going to be a very important part of that. And as you know, this is my perfect vineyard, Catherine. The Catherine Goldschmidt wine is the perfect vineyard. It's head prune. It's basically an old California head prune system. The wires were thrown on there in later years, but you can see how well positioned the clusters are throughout the canopy. Today on a new plantation, you'll see all the clusters in a straight line across here. But in this old head pruned or California uh, prune system, you can see we have great light exposure throughout the cluster and on the, each individual berries because the clusters are really loose. This is obviously not a clonal situation which you've heard me talk about previously. Doesn't look like much, but this is the most perfect vineyard in the whole world. This is the Yeoman Vineyard and it's a terraced vineyard. It's the only vineyard that I have that's a terrace, so it goes from east to southeast, so it's a fairly cool site. The soil is just incredible. 
it's just a pure loam and uh, gravels about a meter down and just unbelievable <laughs> it's cane pruned as you can see so that's uh, last year's wood being laid down and then that's this year's wood so last year's wood is that cane this year's wood and um, they prune it that way every year and the thing that also is really cool with this it's an old field selection this is uh, the Jenkins selection and you can see that the berries are completely individual and very small so the clusters are really loose and every berry ripens at about the same speed and the berries themselves are absolutely minute so definitely closer to the 0.8 gram rather than 0.95 gram that typical Cabernet is so just an amazing combination of everything we have a little bit of senescing going on now on the um, slightly afternoon side if you can call it that and then on the more morning side we don't we have much less senescing anyway crazy vineyard so good look at that just beautiful soil and I uh, love making wine from here so this is the Yeoman 2016 so yeah there's it's really hard to get vineyards that are absolutely perfect this these days considering we're going to get the row direction right the open cluster which is not easy for us to do because mainly it's clonal getting the canopy open and making sure uh, we get good water penetration during irrigation if we choose to do that and then how do we get to the old vine situation? Because I do believe that the old vines do give us more naturally balanced. And I, I think they give us less dry tannins, but uh, that's my opinion. And the ripening is quite different too. It tends to be slower uh, rather than, remember the clones these days are grown for tons and fast accumulation of sugar. So the constraints, you know, how do we get there? How do we uh, get there in 2020 in terms of finding the uh, ideal um, planting conditions? We've got a lot of legal loophole, uh, legal constraints that we have to get through. We, you know, for instance, as you know, up on Staircase Vineyard, I still don't have a permit to pull the vines out. The guys are waiting to pull the vines out, but I just can't get anyone up there to inspect it. And as a result, I won't be able to plant this year. I have to wait a whole year because I just can't get a guy up there to inspect the vineyard. Uh, if we're over 15% slope, you have to get a permit. If you're over 30% slope, it's pretty, it's almost impossible to get a permit. Uh, how do we control the amount of water or how many straws can go in the ground for the same aquifer? And we are going to have issues with that in the future is I think that we're starting to head into a new drought season, starting with this 2020 vintage. We had very little rainfall this year, less than 30%. The cost of labor, it's not like, the price of grapes are going up, but it's not because of the, the growers. The growers aren't making more money, I can tell you that. But the price, until recently, the price of fuel, the price of tractors, the price of labor, and we actually have to hire extra people to manage the labor because we have to have three forms of identification, Everybody has to work separately. Uh, you have to pay for people to have lunch, which means that you have to time them. You have to put a stopwatch on them, the time, amount of time it takes them to walk back down the road to the end of the road to have lunch. I mean, it's just so complicated these days. And then on top of that, there's new diseases that we're having to put up with. So in actual fact, it's a very hard uh, position to be as a grower. So when you hear of a price increase or, or whatever, realize that it, it, it's not the winery making more money or the, or the, or the vineyard owner making more money. It's just a cost of doing business. And we see it. I mean, we see it every day. There is an inflation each year and we have to keep up with that. Opportunities versus the past. We have the ability. I mean, when I started, there was only one tractor size and that one tractor size fits all. Of course, these days we have a lot of different tractor sizes um, and a ways to mechanize them. And I'm going to show you some of those. The bacteria, we're able to add bacteria these days. So this is going to free up. So we look at nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. They're the main three elements that we look at in soil. And the soil has plenty of those elements, but the roots can't get to them. So there are new bacterias that uh, have been invented or created or that we can put through the drip system. And these bacteria break down ammonia into single, uh, single elements. And so the vines can actually get to the nitrogen rather than having to put nitrogen through the drip system or onto the foliar, we can actually add bacteria to the soil to release the nitrogen that's already there. 
I talked about nutrients and fertilizer. Obviously, fertilizer is, is important, but I'm trying to do that in our own vineyards by not uh, by doing more mowing rather than disking and creating our own organic layer naturally. And then timing, especially of irrigation, that's been, you know, basically when when it gets hot, we turn the water on. That was the old thing. But now we have much more specific ways to to irrigate. And I think we get better results personally if we start irrigating now when we get bud push rather than waiting until the, the vines need it. And then knowledge, just history. That's really important. The, so the three main issues today are labor, water, and vine health. And we're gonna show you each a little bit of that. Uh, machine harvesting is better than hand harvesting. I, we could talk all day about that, but I showed last time that, um, especially with Sauvignon Blancs, you know, we can cold, we can, we can harvest in the cold, we can ferment with the cold, uh, we deliver cold. Um, that's, that's really important for us. And of course, in Marlborough, we, we've got 10 days to basically pick the whole valley. And so once the machines start, they just go crazy. Uh, the timing and the leafing, driver accuracy, we'll, we'll show a couple of slides of that. And then the new spray systems, uh, we'll talk about, I'll just quickly show you a couple of, of um, uh, photos of that, but mechanical weeding is really cool. And I'm gonna show you a quick video of that. So this is the traditional system. This is a misting spray. And uh, this is a controlled droplet applicator. So I couldn't find, I know I have a photo, but I couldn't find the photo. But this is a, uh, a tractor that we can put these CDAs on and we can target right into the, the, the canopy zone. And obviously we're spraying, we only spray one thing these days and that's sulfur. And we only use that uh, for powdery and mildew. So basically most vineyards here in California are farmed organically. We're not, we don't have to spray a lot of these Bordeaux sprays. Uh, to control other pests and diseases because we live in beautiful California and everything is nice and warm and, and culturally correct. We don't end up with botrytis and other, some of the other diseases. But these CDA sprays have been around now for about 20 years and they become uh, uh, really important. And the, the amount of spray that we're using is way less. Obviously, we get, we've got much thinner tractors uh, so we can plant uh, closer together. So when, you know, this is the conversation about when people talk about tons per acre or tons per hectare, it's much more interesting to talk about vines per acre or vines per hectare, because that gives you more of an indication rather than, than tons per acre. Uh, this is a machine that, if I put this one here, this is actually adding bird netting. I'll show you a photo of that a little bit later. But this is just an example. We could do the same thing for hail netting and for shade cloth machine harvesters that you guys have seen before. This is a, a new broad system where it has the saddles. We actually collect the grapes on the machine, on the back of the machine here, rather than having another tractor drive down the road. So that uh, saves fuel and more labor. And it also has a destemmer on here as well. So we can actually destem. So this thing is just full of pure berries rather than uh, stems that used to come, we used to get the odd stem come through with the machine harvesting as well. And we can actually put berry sorters on here. So we can actually sort the berries on this machine using infrared if we so choose. And then this is a tractor that's being used as a pre-pruner. So this is a spur position vineyard and they can come through and take all the, take all the wood out of the uh, vineyard rather than having somebody pull it. Doesn't mean much to you guys, but that's the damn coolest machine I've ever seen. <laughs> so what that machine does is it's, it saves us using uh, herbicides and that's a mechanical weeder. So basically what it's doing is it's taking um, the weeds out of the vineyard and then throwing the dirt back underneath. So it's actually creating a mulch. And these, this is the beginning. Um, You'll ask, you know, what the, the, the situation is when we talk about stony vineyards. We, we have to create a, um, a method for doing that with stony vineyards. And basically, we're going to use weed whackers uh, that are being put on machines right now to, to take the weeds down that way. But when you have a nice sandy, gravelly, loamy or any of those soils, you can certainly use that machine. So uh, this is the difference. This is us uh, harvesting Chelsea Merlot, and this is how we pick uh, Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand. So we still traditionally 
you know, people still think hand harvest is better, but basically we're only using hand harvesting where we can't machine harvest. Because you can see this is a nice flat vineyard, but because we have a use system, we continue to use uh, uh, hand harvesting. In the future, when we establish a vineyard like that, we'll probably put it on a VSP like the situation in New Zealand, which this is the Fitzroy vineyard where we make Boulder Bank. We would probably put that system here uh, so eventually, if we ever had to, we'd go to uh, machine harvest. But you can see these guys have got headlights on their heads and they are picking early morning. Leaf removal, and I talked a little bit about that block three cab, um, Cabernet, um, sorry, Merlot up on the Okanagan. This is, a, this is a Chardonnay vineyard where we had the same issue, where we removed the leaves up high. And so we can put these mechanized, um, we can put leaf blowers or leaf suckers to remove the leaves in whatever area we want. This obviously was done by hand, which is very accurate. With a machine, you'll actually see some shredding of the leaves, but uh, same result. Tipping, which is another thing that's done by uh, machine. You can see this is a really bad result because these canes were not in the vertical position. And so when they came along and they tipped, they basically cracked the, uh, the stems. And if, if the shoots are not tucked correctly, you end up with a short shoot situation that's done by machine. And this is also a big no-no. And I see this way too often where shoots have not been tucked and so they're still out here. And when the machine comes through tipping, because uh, they also do the side of the canopy at the same time, these shoots get cut. And so you only end up with like two or three leaves to ripen the two clusters. Another issue that we have, which we can uh, help with mechanization is shade cloth. So here's a vineyard that's been sunburned. And uh, this, I put this vineyard to try and cover two here. This is, this is the Okanagan, believe it or not, where we get sunburn. And this is the Uko Valley where we grow chakras. And this is actually hail netting. And they've got clips. So you can see the clip here. And when the tractor comes underneath, it can actually lift and go under. The other alternative is for shade cloth, we just take this black and we, we wrap it straight down onto the canopy. And so that's fairly common as well, and you'll have seen that in many vineyards. But in Argentina, because we also have uh, the hail, we, we do both. We provide the shade and hail protection at the same time. This is an example in New Zealand of just bird netting because birds are just a massive pest. And speaking of pests, Rabbits, coyotes, bears, birds, uh, and we even named one of our wines after the bird, the wax eye, the forefather's wax eye. Coyotes, uh, that's what I'm dealing with right now. Uh, I've been out in our vineyard at home because the coyotes, they attack the drip lines because that's the only place where there's water. There's free water in those drip lines. And so unfortunately the coyotes, uh, to get the water, they bite into the drip line and then when we turn the irrigation on we're full of uh, fountains everywhere so we've got to go along and fix those every year. I'm going to show you some uh, viruses but basically I'm going to just talk about termites which I'd never seen before and Utaipa and then in terms of bacteria and molds we're going to look at botrytis and powdery mildew. We don't have downy mildew in California but it's a big problem in New Zealand and Australia so they have to spray copper for that rather than sulfur. And then insects become even more of an issue when we talk about organic vineyards. This is bear damage. So this is what bears do in Canada. Uh, they basically just sit under the vine and strip it. And uh, we have many methods for trying to contain bears, but nothing seems to work. So this is a whole bunch of end posts that were put along the, the, uh, the fence line, but you can see the bear just pulls them out like chopsticks. I mean, it's, it's very hard to uh, get a bear to, um, to, to maintain a bear. They just basically lean on these posts, as you can see, and use them like a trampoline until they, can, until they find a weak one that they can get through. Really, really impossible to, uh, to control. This is rabbit damage. I'm sorry, I couldn't find a really bad photo of rabbit damage, but these are the rabbit fences that we're now putting up. Uh, this this photo is in, um, in, 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 in called Chawa. And uh, basically what rabbits do is uh, there's no moisture in the hills anymore. So they come down and they, the only moisture they can find is in the vine. And so they girdle the vine. And this is, we've lost hundreds and hundreds of acres to rabbits. And hopefully uh, our rabbits here in California don't need to eat the vine. But this has become a major problem as global warming or global uncertainty continues to occur 
and there's a shortage of water, the, the rabbits go for the only moisture and that's in the vineyard. This is my worst nightmare, powdery mildew. This is the worst. Uh, this is powdery mildew right here on the cane. This is what happens as a result, the berries split. I can make, I can make wine out of botrytis. I cannot make wine out of powdery mildew. Absolutely impossible. The wines are so bitter, green and harsh, they're basically undrinkable. We've basically got it under control these days, but this is a vineyard in Napa, believe it or not, uh, where they did not get it under control. And this is a, this is a, um, the, the berries here, and, the, and this is actually a Chardonnay vineyard, and this is a, a Cabernet vineyard. Both of these vineyards were in Napa, unfortunately. And I just said to the guy, I mean, we basically, we're gonna drop all the fruit on the ground. You just can't make wine from it. This is a new disease that started to pop up in uh, more fertile areas. This is, this is called Maganaroas. Unlike Phylloxera, Phylloxera can uh, die eventually, eventually. Maganaroas can live for uh, four or five generations with no, with no nutrients and no water at all. And this is one here. That's how big they are, so you can actually see them. This is on a vine root. Um, and uh, you can see how basically it just constricts the growth of the root. And this is a, a really mature vin uh, vine that is gradually dying. And of course, viruses, we have leaf roll one, leaf roll two. This is clone 338, uh, sorry, 337 Cabernet, which is certified clean, but you can see it's not. And so 337 in many instances is being ripped out, even though it was a certified clone, it was not 100% clean. Remember I talked, very early on about Mary stem tissue culture, where you take a leaf, you slit the vein and you grow the vine, you take the tip, you grow the vine, you take the tip, you grow the vine, you're out growing the virus. So we call it heat treatment. And we talk about how many times the vine was heat treated. So today, typically we talk about three heat treatments, but this vine 337 clone was only done on one heat treatment. So it did carry some virus and we didn't know that. This is another big, Issue, it was discovered in Australia. This vineyard is in Australia as well. This is Ceratocline. And what Ceratocline does, it's a virus that gets in here and constricts the phloem. And so you, this is, I pulled the bark away here and you can see the cracking that occurs here. And so after about, these vines can normally last about six or seven years with Ceratocline and eventually they die. And so Cerar is gonna become an interesting variety as we go forward. We've started to see Syrah decline show here in California as well. And we certainly um, have seen it in uh, Chile. I have not seen it in Argentina. And this is the bad boy that I've talked about a lot. This is, this is Utaipa. This is a vine that we actually split right down the middle. And uh, you can see uh, how the, all that black is the Utaipa, is the virus that's uh, restricting the phloem and when we cut the vine, you can see this vine is starting to die. And eventually it'll die all the way around here and the vine, the vine will have no access to water from below. This is an example of the vine dying. And you can see right now, this vine only has a small amount of life left in it before it'll, it'll um, pass on. So this is a vine that's had Utaipa. And so what we did was we decided in this instance, instead of replanting it, we thought we'd give it a go. So we took a shoot that was right down near the original uh, bud that was grafted onto this rootstock, and we brought a cane up. So what we're doing now is to maintain that, we're just going to remove these shoots. And so we just want to have two at the top, and that's what we'll be training for next year. So. This is part of suckering, but this is a one way to replace a Utaipa or dying vine. So one thing that's been practiced for many years, and even in vineyards in France and parts of France and Bordeaux, they will replace a dead vine in a really good vineyard with a new vine. Assuming that the, the trellising is correct, the vine spacing is correct, the irrigation is all good, We'll just rip out that dead vine and we'll put in a new one. So yesterday we put in this vine. It's a little unique because it's not a normal bench graft. Normally the bud would be down here, but this vine's a little bit older. This is what we call a magnum vine. And so the bud is a little bit higher. Even though we'll use a protective casing around it, being a little bit higher means 
that when we use uh, tractors to control the weeds, this vine will be less damaged and the, and the soil will not go over the graft union. And that's important because it means that we don't get scion rooting, which we want to try and avoid. But that graft union is above the soil enough that it won't be covered. And then secondly, it won't need as much water, even though we're irrigating right now, it won't need as much water as a brand new little vine would, would need. Anyway, so replacing young vines in old vineyards is not a bad idea. And I think that when you pick it, we won't pick it together with the old vine until about seven years, but it adds a little bit more freshness and a little bit more acidity. As the vines get older, the pH has increased, the vines become more balanced. So you've got a, another way to get a little bit of complexity if you want to look at it that way. And that has been done in France for years and, and, and Italy and other countries. And I'm, I'm, a, bit, I'm a, as I said in the video, as long as, as long as everything is good, the irrigation, the trellis and the spacing is all good, why not just replace the old vine with a young vine? And um, because normally the economic life expectancy of a vineyard is about 30 years, but if we can do this, if we, and if we can keep the percentages close to one or 2% replacement every year, you're basically replanting the vineyard every 30 years anyway. Okay, the other, the other bad boy is uh, Botrytis, and we have gray rot and noble rot. So this unfortunately is, is the beginnings of gray rot. This could go either way. The problem is that when you get rain, the berries swell up and split. And so these mycelium, if it, if it didn't rain, these mycelium basically suck the water out of the berry and concentrate the sugar. And that's of course how we make petritose wines or late harvest wines. But if it rains, these skins are really soft because the mycelium have cracked these skins as they suck the water out. So if it rains, these berries wanna swell up again and that's when they split and that's when you get gray rot. And that's, that's the bad stuff that has to be dropped. Um, we can make wine out of it, it's not very good, but it's certainly better than powdery mildew. I'm not sure if you can see this, this is Botrytis, and you can see we have mycelium on the outside of this. The mycelium grow through the skin, and in dry conditions pull the water out and concentrate the berry, and that's where we get Botrytis wines. But if we get rain, we get grey rot. You can see that berry there has got a split on it, and that's grey rot. So if it rains, the mycelium have already broken the skin, and that's how we get the grey rot as the berries expand, absorbing up the water, and not a good condition. So unfortunately we've got grey rot here rather than noble rot uh, on this Chardonnay vine. Just when you think you've seen everything, any sort of damage in vines, we come across a new one for me. This is termite damage. Watch this Look. guys, it's amazing. Just, the vine is just crumbling in my hands. So this is termites and what we do is we take all the bark off. It's just incredible. Termite damage. The next thing we have to look out for. Crazy. I mean seriously I thought I'd seen everything and then I saw termites. Apparently this has been a problem in that vineyard for some time and I never knew about it. The other big deal or the one that I uh, have a big struggle with is leaf hoppers and normally what uh, we would obviously it's very difficult for us to spray these days so if we see uh, seven of these leaf hoppers per leaf that's usually the magic number that we spray for this is the end result and I remember having a discussion with a very famous vineyard and a very famous consultant and this has always been my answer and the uh, the viticulturalist said um, you're telling you know the the leaf hoppers don't destroy the fruit and the very famous consultant said to the very famous grower, are you telling me that leaf hoppers improve quality? <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny. So uh, today we have to, when we spray, we have to use oils and soaps, unless we want to go back to insecticides and I don't want to go back to insecticides. So we have to be very careful with the timing of the oils and the soaps that we use against these uh, leaf hoppers. And these leaf hoppers can have three or four generations uh, within, the, within the season. So they can create huge devastation. Uh, this is the other uh, disease uh, insect that we had a problem with we, until we got it under control. Uh, really started to show up in 2000 and uh, was the vine mealybug. Now there's two mealybugs that we talk about. 
the vine mealy bug are the ones that obviously live on the vine and then the grape mealy bug are the ones that live up here and they, they create sugar and it's very interesting I, sh I, I have a little video of ants so the ants want the sugar and they move the mealy bug around on the vine and they basically put the mealy bug into the cluster or onto the vine and create this honeydew and that's what the ants want so the ants actually use the mealy bug for them to create food and this is this was a massive massive issue in Carneros especially and it was being transported by new plantations and so uh, there was a huge control measure that was put in in Carneros and other areas and hope we're learning to live with it but we've basically we've really lowered the uh, the the amount of uh, mealy bug that we're getting in there but the great mealy bug is really bad it is not something that we want and it's less it's not around as much as the vine mealy bug. The vine mealy bug we can control by removing the bark because the, the ants can't take the mealy bug up past um, on uh, without the bark on the vine. You guys have all heard about the glassy wing sharpshooter. That is, this is a glassy wing sharpshooter. This is not really an issue for us up here in North in Northern California. For those who wonder why Orange County was named Orange County, well, it was because it was planted with oranges, right? And the reason why the, it wasn't because of urban sprawl, but basically the glassy wing sharpshooter came from the south, from the warmer environments, and lived in the orange trees. And that's what wiped out a lot of the orange orchards and also wiped out a lot of the vineyards and Temecula and places like that. What we have to deal with, though, is this guy. This is a blue-green sharpshooter. And the, the reason why we have to deal with this guy is because he spreads this stuff. This is Pierce's disease. This actually is a photo of... Uh, of the vineyard by my house, we have Pierce's disease because these blue-green sharpshooters who are much smaller than the glassy wing, they're about, it's hard to tell, but these things are about 30% uh, the size of a, of a glassy wing. These guys are very hard to see. And we put up yellow tape around vineyards. You may see in yellow tape around vineyards and it's sticky and it collects these guys, but they live in riparian habitats. So they live down by the river and they live in the, in the, uh, the periwinkle and native grape which are down in the vineyard and down by the river areas. And speaking of biodynamics and organics, this is a vineyard uh, that is planted organically and you can see how it's struggling. We've got the weeds underneath competing for the water. Uh, we have very short canopy and it's very hard to grow a vineyard from day one organically, I'm afraid, without a hell of a lot of mechanization. And with mechanization, of course, it's going against what we're trying to do, which would be organic. So what I'm recommending is that we plant more traditionally using older vines, but for the first two, maybe three years, we grow uh, traditionally, but still without insecticides, and then convert over to become organic. This is another organic vineyard, and uh, you'll see uh, the weeds are out of control in this, in this situation. And so weed control is the big deal, and you saw the machine that has been invented. Uh, and the other problem that we get is spider mites. And without being able to uh, use a lot of different soaps and oils, uh, we've been had a real big problem controlling spider mites, and that's been a real negative for organic vineyards. So putting man into the vineyard, um, we have a number of, of, of things that we do. We irrigate, we suck, we deal with the short shoots, and we deal with the VSP, uh, which we've talked about before. Um, but this is a situation where the irrigation was out of control. And you can see that we've got a lot of uh, defoliation and yet we've still got, this is a Merlot vineyard and you can see this particular vineyard was uh, just basically, we had to be, we were forced to pick because the, the irrigation was mismanaged. Uh, very sad situation, it was almost 100 acres of Merlot that had to be harvested. And this was the result of that fruit and you can see how much dehydration we got. I'm standing in the vineyard and this is the colour of the water that we're getting out. I guess it's not filtered. So one of the other issues is that we often walk into vineyards and see stress and we see blocked emitters or the drippers. And uh, so the first thing I do is I just I uncouple the hose and see what colour the water is. And you can see why the drippers were blocked in that vineyard. It was because the vineyard, the water was full of dirt because the filter system wasn't working. This is also a lack of, uh, as I said before, this is a machine that's come through and trimmed. We've made a short shoot and uh, we've got a short shoot here too. So these clusters need to come off because you just cannot ripen. These clusters taste completely different to one on a regular shoot. 
Rodrigo, what do we got here? Looks like uh, Mel Beck grown in a funny pattern. It's not like that, my friend. This is Syrah. Oh, Syrah. Yeah. Okay. Syrah, Syrah um, managed in in the traditional Codurone way, where where you tie two two gobelets together, and that allows you to 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 produce a little bit of shadow to the next plant, so that protects a little bit your grace from the sun. One, and the other thing is that. You don't have too much uh, second shoots because you don't cut the, the you don't tip the plant, so the the vine uh, ripe earlier a little bit, uh, so you have good condition for the grapes and early early maturity uh, with a very nice fruit and acidity in general for the syrah. So what do you call this? I don't have a real name. We call it the bridge because you the bridge. <laughs> two 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 different uh, gobelets. Uh, but the technique at the end is to the, the, the main issue is to protect the plant from the sun, the, the grapes from the sun. I really like what you said too. I like the short shoot, uh, lack of much less short shoots, so less congestion, so yes. Yes. better ripening. I think it's it's yeah, awesome. And longer shoot too. Yep. And the longer shoot, yeah. Longer shoot with more leaves. Yep. So Perfect. It. It's going to make great wine, I'm sure. Yeah, you're yeah. going to taste it. <laughs> Okay, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm just going to show what it what we do when it comes to suckering. Now, this is a spur position vine, so we left a two bud spur here. So these are the two shoots that we will keep. The rest of them are water shoots or replacement shoots. So water shoots meaning there's a lot of water or there's a lot of vigor in these arms, and they will push extra growth or extra shoots. So we want to take those off. I'm going to um, actually leave this one here as a potential replacement for next year because we want to keep the spur positions as close as we can down there. So all the rest can come off around. And there we go, we just have uh, the two replacements, uh, the two uh, uh, positions that we left for last year and the one that we will leave for next year. Hi, this is Nick. I'm looking at a cane prune vineyard here. So this is the cane that we laid down in the fall this year. So this is last year's wood. And you can see we have one bud here instead of two that we normally get on a spur prune vineyard. Another bud here, another bud here. So you can see that all these shoots are very clearly separated. So very little suckering is required. We leave one shoot here this will be the replacement cane for next year that we'll lay down. This is an extra water shoot so we can take that off. And we'll just clean around the head. We leave, uh, we always leave two, two canes in the head on one side and two on the other. And again, we take off anything that's small or uh, in the way. Anyway, that's how you uh, sucker a cane prune vineyard. A little bit quicker than the, what we do with a spur prune. Yeah, so that, the first video that I showed you was um, uh, a quite a famous uh, winemaker that uh, you may or may not know, but uh, it was a really interesting design that uh, he, he has created, and I'm going to be implementing that same design on the Staircase Vineyard. Even though I said Mel Beck, Mel Beck was in my mind, he corrected me, it was Syrah, but what we're planning on Staircase is we're going to plant Mel Beck like that. And then I just showed I you two quick videos on how we sucker a spur prune vineyard and how we sucker a cane prune vineyard. This is just my last photo. Uh, this is this is my nightmare. This is compaction. You can clearly see someone drove this tractor in the winter and it formed these uh, uh, rivets or whatever you want to call it because of the clay, the amount of clay soil that's in here. And then the tractor continues to drive over here and the soil just becomes more and more compact and it's very hard for roots to get through and very hard for water to penetrate. And I can show you videos of that, but not today. I have a question. I find this an interesting observation. This is a situation the, uh, where near my house has been 100% disked. So they took the grass that had grown over the season and they've disked it in, they've disked in every row. So the disadvantage of this for me is that later on in the season, if we get rain, it's very hard to get tractors in and it causes a lot of bogging down especially if we get rains close to the end of harvest or close to harvest uh, and also over time the soil tends to blow away 
anyway that's what my view of that over here is more traditional California which is disking every second row they have left grass covered down well I don't know why they've left uh, a few rows here but I don't know maybe they didn't do every other row but traditionally that would be the way they do it in California leaving the grass during the season for the uh, whole for the whole year so that we can get water penetration makes it easy to drive tractors but if we do have a frost at this time of the year it's a little bit harder con to control in New Zealand we typically leave every row with a cover crop because we generally do get rain it's a cooler season but this of course is California where it tends to be drier as we head into another year of drought I'm not a big fan of this vineyard just looking at it with you now because they're obviously using herbicide under the vine which is something that I've stayed away from you can always tell you can see that the vine has clear earth or no weeds underneath the vine which means they are using herbicides not a good thing anyway just the difference between leaving a cover crop and not leaving a cover crop two farmers next to each other farming in two very different ways so in conclusion i think uh the, i touched on some of the most important things but aspect and row orientation and spacing are the three biggies for me if i had to narrow it down and then looking at where we were in the history and, and why those vineyards were really unique and, and growing really well. And, and I think you saw that if we can create vineyards that we don't use herbicide, we don't use insecticide, and then using the right plant material that allows us to have nice, loose, open clusters. And those the sort of vineyards and blocks that we really look for with Yeoman and, and Catherine and obviously with Hillary and Game Ranch as well. But how do we get there for the future? Because we've got so many issues to consider and I hopefully uh, you saw some of those today as, as, as we went around some vineyards around the world. So from Canada to Chile, Argentina, and obviously in California. Oh, and New Zealand, we even saw a photo of New Zealand. So uh, there are many issues, but I think we can, by continuing to consult and work with other companies, I get to learn what they are doing and hopefully we can, we can bring that um, back into California. Again, these are my contacts if you ever want to get a hold of me. Uh, I do have a new cell phone. My cell phone is uh, working. I don't know who's calling me, but I do have a new cell phone that people can get a hold of me on. So we'll finish it there, and I'm going to st stick around. If anyone's got any uh, any questions, I'm going to take you guys all off um, off uh, mute if I can. So uh, I want to thank you, thank you guys for sticking around, and uh, I'll take any questions, and I will send you the link on this. Uh, once I download it on the YouTube a little later today. So thanks again and spread the word. And tomorrow, uh, sorry, next Friday, I'm going to, I'm thinking I'm going to discuss uh, Oakville versus Alexander Valley as cool. a challenge. We'll see how that would go. Thank you again. Thanks, Nick. Cool. cool. A phrase I was unfamiliar with, senescing, when you were talking about yeoman. Yeah, so senescing uh, can be brought on by uh, many uh things but we like to see people people have always said you know you want a little bit of stress in a vineyard you know in terms of harvest well one of those indicators is senescing and and you saw me on one of my other presentations i think it was in the first meeting where i will actually touch the leaves i feel the leaf i want to feel what temperature that leaf is depending on the time of the day and then i i uh rub the leaves and if i it, if i hear the you know the the crispy sound versus the no crispy sound that tells me more if if the vine is in stress or not when it comes close to harvest i like to see a little bit of senescing like uh four or five leaves per plant because it means that we're just getting to the end and for that last three or four days i really i do want to have that cluster uh dehydrate just slightly if i can just get it to dehydrate slightly. And the reason is not because of sugar or anything like that is because when we de-stem the berries no. actually come off Almost. stems easier so uh that that's important for me so i like i like to um, be able to do that if that makes sense mark Did i answer your question i'm still not sure what senescing is well senescing is the yellow is the yellow leaf okay
and uh, eventually that leaf will fall off if we if we waited long enough. I showed that photo of that big Merlot vineyard that unfortunately uh, the whole vineyard was senescing, <laughs> where you saw that leaves were yellow from top to bottom. That is not a good situation. And when I walked into that vineyard, they're asking me for my opinion. I'm like, dude, <laughs> we're not going anywhere here. The only thing we're going to get now is dehydration because those yellow leaves are not photosynthesizing. So a senescing leaf does nothing for the vine except provide perhaps a little bit of shade, but it certainly gives us an indication to how much stress the vineyard is under. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Luke. I have it. I got a question. So uh, in that vineyard, you had uh, a, a bridging system in South America. You had a bridging system of trellising. Does that not, I mean, I understand that you're not tipping, so you don't get lateral shoots, but do you not restrict uh, sun exposure and airflow by tying, tying those uh, tips up together like that? That's true. Well, the alternative is on a goblet system, which is a direct uh, system. We, yeah. I, in uh, my first uh, uh, meeting, we, we showed a goblet in Argentina. The problem with the goblet system is that it's very hard to avoid sunburn. We're always trying to find ways, and, and we don't want those shoots, and we're not in a head prune situation. Uh, we, we just have a bush vine, but we want to train these shoots up. But when we train the shoots up, we get too much sunburn on this system. And you'll notice on that vineyard, it was extremely steep. And so putting a trellis system in there is very hard uh, to maintain the vines. And so how do we increase this, the leaf surface area without getting sunburn? And so we, uh, by tying them together, we get much longer uh, shoots and so we get more leaves per shoot so we can hopefully ripen the crop easier without getting the sunburn so sunlight is not a problem however you are correct and that the wind uh, the lack of the airflow can be an issue and so we need to be careful with that but hopefully because we're on a slope we do get some uh, we get more airflow from uh, warm cool uh, day nights so we do get some airflow that way I assume though, if we did get powdery mildew or botrytis in a, in a vineyard like that, it would be devastating. But right now that vineyard is, is better than the alternative and I've seen way too many goblet systems with sunburn and dehydration and pinking of berries, etc. But you're gonna see it because of course that Malbec that we planted on staircase uh, is designed to, to replicate what Rodrigo was doing there. Thanks, Luke. And for those that don't know, that's my son. <laughs> Ned? Seth? At the end there, you showed those two vineyards, one, one using herbicide, one not. What does the, what does the guy who doesn't want that shit in his vineyard do to mitigate that kind of situation? Sorry, I don't understand. You're talking about the weeds? Well, you know, yeah, well, I mean, if somebody right next to you is using herbicide and you're not, doesn't some of that find its way into your vineyard anyway? I hope not, because if it found its way into my vineyard, it would hit the leaves of the vine and kill the vine. And I've seen... That's what I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah I've seen vineyards where the tractor operator or the spray person got his sprays mixed and he sprayed, he sprayed herbicide on the vine, on the canopy, and killed the vineyard. So... Uh, no, more of the issue, Seth, is if somebody sprays insecticide, because you saw that misting sprayer that I showed you right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. When somebody uses a misting sprayer and they put insecticide in there, that has drift. That is a problem. But herbicide, usually uh, it's not a, CDA, not a CDA sprayer, but very similar to a controlled droplet applicator, where they actually are very specific by spraying um, herbicide under the vine. So we don't normally get drift from herbicide, but we do get drift from uh, mist sprayers. And that, that is an issue. But one thing I didn't mention, Seth, is that the difference, when you walk into a, a non-herbicide, I'm not saying organic here, because I don't want to be generic, but when you walk into a vineyard that is not sprayed with herbicide, the difference in insects is unbelievable. Now, for the first two years, it can be pretty bad. But subsequent to that, after about three or four years, the good guys start outweighing the bad guys. 
So you've got to get through the first couple of years, but after that, uh, you're all in good shape. But I think we're going to be forced into elimination of herbicides anyway, because basically we're not going to be able to use Roundup, uh, which, you know, in fact, I remember as a kid in New Zealand when Roundup was first invented, and this says it all, they called it a plow in a can. And I thought that was hilarious. We all thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. We didn't know what insectic, uh, pesticide, I mean, herbicides were. But to call it a plow in a can, looking back, <laughs> my God, that's incredible. What a great way to describe it. And that's why we don't want to use it anymore. And of course, it goes straight into our groundwater systems, which we're all drinking. Sure. Yeah, one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest fruits out there that's that's that really relies on herbicides is um, strawberries. Strawberries are real tough on the ecosystem. You have to use um, methyl bromide to get rid of the nematodes. I didn't talk about nematodes today, but nematodes are a big issue in <clears> grapes, <throat> but more so in 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 crop that smaller crops like strawberries. And then subsequently, you have to use a lot of weed control. So strawberries. I'm not a strawberry grower and I don't want to go against strawberries, but one of those, that, that, that those guys use a hell of a lot of sprays. Is that because strawberries, when they're growing, a lot of it's directly on the ground? Correct. Those plants are relatively small and methobromide, which is basically a sterilant for soil, can kill nematodes and it can kill nematodes from about a foot down. And so when you're talking about strawberries, they're very shallow root systems. So getting rid of the nematodes allows the strawberry to grow more effectively. Hey, Nick, I have a question about your uh, Canada fields. Uh, early on, you talked about the, the shade side and the sun side of the vines being harvested separately. So, so do you uh, uh, ferment them together or do you uh, identify them separately and then blend them later on? Yeah, we, um, we ferment them separately and blend them later on. It's because uh, sometimes, as I said, we, in that situation, we were picking about five days apart. But I've seen some vineyards where we picked even further apart, seven, eight days apart. And so, you know, in a classic Bordeaux ferment, the fermentation is 90% done after seven days. So we don't want to be hanging these things around. But it's, it's, I don't have much time to explain it, but the, in some situations we are picking the afternoon side or the shady side first because they have a completely different soil and as, um, flavor and acid profile to the, the sunny side. The problem with the sunny side, of course, is you've got to pick around all the clusters that have got the dehydration. And uh, that makes it very difficult because when you're doing field sampling, when you're out doing testing the fields to see what sugar we're at, it's very hard for the person taking the sample to understand what the guy's going to actually pick. And so sometimes when we, it, it makes it really, really difficult to get an accurate sample because we don't know if we should be picking a little bit more sweeter fruit or less sweet fruit. Are the, are the pickers going to leave that stuff behind or are they going to pick it? And sometimes we have dramatically different sugars in the tank than what we thought we were harvesting. So basically, the main problem is the increase in the diversity. And if you take a, we did an experiment where we took a, a clusters from a vineyard like that and we had and we, and, and we measured each individual berry, what the sugar was, and we had a difference of 12 bricks between some of the berries. Now in a more even vineyard, like the Catherine vineyard or the Yeoman vineyard, the variability is gonna be like two bricks. So, I mean, it doesn't, it, it, sound, it sounds like a huge disparity, but it, and it is, but two bricks is relatively tight. That's a very small difference, but, when you have a shady, 100% shady and 100% sunny vineyard, the randomness of the sugar differences in the berries is massive. And it just makes it so, so hard to make a correct picking decision. Thanks, Jim. Whoops, I thought I'd finished recording, but I haven't. So I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>